Well, over the past several weeks, we have been preaching on the topic of getting through the tough stuff. Uh, we have looked at bruised relationships, the unfairnesses of life, fractured health, and shattered expectations. We have learned that apart from a real daily relationship with Jesus Christ, these tough things would be far more difficult to get through. However, with Christ, God's Word reminds us that all things are possible. Amen? He is a powerful God. And He says, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. We have the ability through Christ to overcome. Today we're going to continue in our study of getting through the tough stuff. And it's amazing how many distractions that each of us face on a daily basis. We encounter them every day, those things that, uh, Lord, the, you know, that, that God allows in our lives, and, and yet we, He wants us to learn through them, but yet those things that He's trying to teach us, we're, dis, we're distracted. So probably without a doubt, one of the greatest distractions come in the form of media. Or should I say multiple forms of media. So the title of this morning's message is Getting Through the Tough Stuff of Media Distractions. In fact, one of the sad things my wife and I observe quite regularly are other couples sitting around us while we're out to eat. Have you ever noticed this? Um, most often we're taken aback at the very common scene. Two people sitting nearby for more than 45 minutes and barely three words said. And you look, and both are one of them, at least one of them, maybe both of them, are on their phones. And pretty soon, 45 minutes, an hour passes, and not three words were spoken. They're distracted. Willfully distracted. Intentionally distracted. So that they don't have to communicate. So that they don't have to look at each other. Or maybe they're just too enthralled with everything else that's going on in social media world. Probably most of you have had these types of observations, but most of us would probably agree that these types of scenes are only going to increase and become more and more frequent. In fact, I've witnessed another very familiar scene. One where an individual or several individuals regularly check their phone just to make sure that they haven't missed a call or a text. It's an amazing thing to watch. If you ever sit in some place, uh, maybe you're at the hospital in the waiting room or maybe you're at a restaurant and, and you know, every 10 seconds you've got to check, you know, just, just make sure that I haven't quite missed something. You know, there's actually a medical term for this. It's called phantom vibra vibration syndrome. You laugh, but it's a real thing. Phantom vibration syndrome or phantom ringing is the perception that one's mobile phone is vibrating or ringing even when it's not. Other terms for this concept include ringsiety. You ever had ringsiety? <laughs> the mixture of anxiety over the possibility of missing a ringing phone call. Or... Uh, False alarm, F-A-U-X-A-L-A-R-M, you know, false alarm. You know, there's a world that we live in, and it seems as though we have made ourselves dependent on digital media. If you were to Google this topic, you'll find numerous articles that give evidence of the harmful effects of digital age or the addictive behaviors connected to the digital devices that seem to be controlling our lives. Let me look, let's just for a few and then we'll get into the content of what we're going to discuss today. Number one, broken or poor communication skills or miscommunication. You know, we have come in this digital age to the place where people don't know how to communicate. Most communication takes place through a text message in short blurbs or it takes place through an email, or it takes place on social media itself, where people are airing their dirty laundry, where they're, you know, griping about someone else or attacking somebody through capital letters on Facebook. But because of it, people have lost the art of communication. We, we, we joke about it, but if there's a reality to that, this idea that because of digital devices, even miscommunication, misinformation is going, is going out because there's a less and less 
approach to talking face to face. And it's causing a real problem in our culture. Number two, shortened attention spans. We've realized that in this social media world that we live in, people's attention spans are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You'll find that a couple years ago, the average commercial lasted about two minutes. Today, they're 30 to 45 seconds apiece. That's intentional. Why? Because I can only concentrate on one short thing at a time. And the more we see our children coming up with their phone in a, or their head in a phone, the less and less the attention span is becoming, which leads to other problems, like a decline in academic achievements. I find it amazing that our students are allowed to use cell phones for everything inside the classroom. Raise your hand if you grew up in an age where you were not allowed to have a phone in a classroom. Take a look, take a look around, younger generation. Oliver, get your hand down. How many of you grew up in an age where you're not allowed to have a calculator in math class? I don't know that our... I'll just leave it at that. But all across the country, reports are given that due to the digital devices that are part of everyday norm, achievement scores are going lower and lower. Number three, poor social skills. Where... Kids are awkward around people they don't know. Or they don't know how to have a conversation because they're not used to having them. They'll meet people and they don't know what to say. If it's not a yes or no answer, they can't talk. How have you missed those days, adults? Where you try to have a conversation with somebody half your age and you just can't get anywhere. That's a reality. And it's becoming more and more a problem. Number five. An incredible surge in anxiety and depression. I'm worried about what so-and-so said to me about on Facebook. Or what they didn't say about me on Facebook. I'm worried about who they implied that they were talking about. I know they're talking about me even though they didn't say my name. I know they're referring to me. And we're seeing a surge of anxiety and depression. Which is leading to attempted suicide and suicide. Because of what things are said, or what things are said on social media, all across the country, directly related to being distracted by what everyone else thinks, and if I could just add this little statement, more than what God thinks. And then, could I just say the obvious? Increase in accidents. Um, already since I've gotten my truck. I've had two accidents, neither of which I was there for, neither of which I was even in the area of. But the second one was caused because a guy, when somebody in the church borrowed my truck, he goes, Pastor, you might want to come out your door and turn left and walk about 100 steps. I'm like, why? Uh, somebody just ran into the back of me while I borrowed your truck. I'm like, oh, come on. Are you kidding me? I thought he was joking. So I walk out my front door, turn left. Sure enough. A little compact car up under the right-hand side of my rear, rear of my bed. He was on his phone. Didn't notice that he'd been stopped for two minutes waiting for a car to turn left on Colony. Accidents. Constantly. Because people are distracted by their phones. We asked this question, what did you do before cell phones? You had to wait. Leave a message. Check the messages later. But that's not part of our culture anymore. In fact, listen to the true story I just read about. This is a true story. It happened uh, in 2006. As Delta Airlines Flight 5191 left its gate at Bluegrass Airport near Lexington, Kentucky, nothing seemed unusual. It was the morning of August 27th, and as the pilots taxied toward the runway, they made a light conversation with each other. That morning's flight would have been like any other were it not for a fatal error. The pilots took their plane to the wrong runway. Within a few minutes, the flight was over. All the passengers and all but one of the crew members were dead because the pilots had become complacent and distracted. 
They failed to follow proper procedures. Procedures that, if followed, would have stopped them from using too short a runway. That horrible accident is a graphic illustration of one of the dangers associated with distraction. It was amazing that as these two pilots were conversing with each other, just talking about the week, talking about the day, and you can go back and you can actually Google this event and you can listen to the final moments before the accident took place. Four times in a conversation, they were told to go to runway 26 and they kept proceeding to runway 22. And because of the light conversation of just being complacently distracted, they took off on too short a runway. In fact, the one pilot even said, why isn't this runway lit up with lights? Oh, well, brought it up to 130-some knots, and off they went, and just moments later, smashed the airplane, and all but one died. Completely, 100% avoidable, but distracted by complacent talk. Today I bring up the subject of media distraction. However, it may not be the distraction of media that takes a grip on you and affects your life. Distraction may come in many forms as it refers to social media. Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and a host of other ones that are constantly being invented on our handheld digital devices. But you may be distracted by the news, by your job, by your hobbies, by the media, your grandkids. What is it that distracts you? What is it that just kind of captivates you to the point that it, devo- it, it, it engrosses your entire time? What is that? And before we go much further, let's define what it is that we're being distracted from. I believe that we are distracted primarily in the area of relationships and specifically two areas of relationships. Our relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, and our relationship with those around us. How annoying is it? And I'm sure we're all guilty of it at one point or another where someone is trying to talk to us and we're so busy looking at our phones that we can't really even have a conversation. I'm telling you, I'm guilty. I've worked at it. And there are times that my kids will say, Dad's on his phone. I'm like, okay, I'll slam the thing down. You have my attention. But what does it take to get our attention where it needs to be? On our relationships. Relationship with God and our relationship with our family and those around us. Isn't it amazing how we don't have time to read God's Word or pray as we ought? Think about this. But we have time to spend two minutes here and two minutes there and three minutes here and four minutes there on Facebook to check out what's going on around the world around us. I thought just for a moment this week. What would happen if I took that two minutes you know, in the morning and this three minutes a little while later? And it says the average person looks at their Facebook account every ten minutes. Companies are saying our employees are wasting our time. I can't get a full day's work out of them because they're constantly on their phones. How many of you have ever been to a shoe store? And you're trying to get some help to find a pair of shoes. And you'll notice four employees around on their phones. How many times have you been to Walmart and you're looking for a product, you're trying to find somebody, and you find all the workers at Walmart on their phones? Every store you go to. And employers are saying it's costing us a lot. Because we can't get a full day of undivided attention on their job. It's costing us. But I wonder if we added up all the two minutes and the three minutes and the four minutes and the five minutes, how much time would we have to spend in time reading God's Word and praying? We kind of look at it as like, well, in order for me to read, i got, I, I got to have a half hour, 45 minutes. How about we read until God speaks to us? If that's two or three minutes, take the two or three minutes. And just like we would in a half hour checking our Facebook status, seeing who liked it and disliked it, let's get back in the Word and say, hey, let me, let me continue where I left off. Let me spend a few more minutes in prayer. We are a country that is distracted 
by the simplest of things. I wonder if we added up all those time frames. How much better would it be off? We'd be off if we were to give some of that time to God. Well, is it then wrong to enjoy these, enjoy these social media outlets? Is it, is it wrong? Not necessarily. But as a child of God, our relationship with Him should be our priority. If social media or other things that distract or hinder our relationship with God or others, we should reprioritize our time so that our relationship with God does have priority. And I think moderation and balance are the key. If you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. For the next few moments, I want to share a few verses that talk about some of these things that we're talking about as far as distraction and priorities and balance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12, it says, Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Think about that just for a moment. That very phrase, I should not be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit. So if my social media accounts, plural, whether it's Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and whatever other ones, has your undivided attention most of the time, it could be that you're addicted to those things. And God's Word makes it clear, we should not be addicted to anything. We should not be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit. And then can I just say this as far as I've tied this in with our messages in Exodus? Anything that we give more time and attention and our focus to, anything that we give our more, more time, attention, and focus to has the potential of becoming an idol in our life. A phone can be an idol. Any other digital device can be an idol. A hobby can be an idol. A relationship can be an idol. A job can be an idol. If we are controlled by those things, then we're in sin. Because God's Word is very clear. He says, I will not be mastered by anything. Which typically means, or practically means, we should not be addicted. Nothing should have us. It's okay to have the things, but the things should not have us. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 27, it says this, It is not good to eat too much honey or to seek glory after glory. I remember thinking about this as I was reading through this verse. Okay, so it's not good to have too much honey, but what about steak? Can you have too much steak, really? Can you have too much pizza? Well, now that I'm gluten-free, yeah, you can have too much. But, you know, the bottom line is, it's okay to enjoy the things that God gives us. But they shouldn't captivate us to the point that they interfere with our relationship with Him or others. And it doesn't matter whether it's food or whether it's Facebook. We need to be careful that the things of life that God gives us to enjoy don't overcome us. So how do we go about making the changes if we are experiencing these distractions? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, all of us face some of these distractions. We all do. Uh, I think back to the time, and I, <laughs> I can remember, and I still, I'm still guilty. In fact, Teresa, she knows. She's found my... Um, I was in here last night. I was by myself. No, no, Friday night. And I had the speaker out, and I had the music blaring, and I was just enjoying my own little concert. But there are also times, don't laugh, she was laughing at me so bad. <laughs> it's bad. But there are times that I get in the car, and my kids will say, hey, give me the aux cord for my iPhone. And what do I say, Andrea, David? Enjoy the sound of silence. Isn't it a beautiful sound? Dad's going weird again. <laughs> what controls us? What dominates us? What captivates us? How do we go about making the changes if we're experiencing these kinds of distractions? I think there's a great verse that we need to look at in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm just going to give you a four or five verses here for us to consider and ponder. 
In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Two key phrases in those verses. Number one, lay aside every hindrance. What is it that hinders your walk with God? You know what it is. All of us does. What is it that hinders and comes in the way of your commitment, your devotion, your ability to spend time with God and to nurture that relationship? What hinders that? He says, lay aside every hindrance. Is it a social media account? Is it a digital device? Is it a TV? Is it a job? Is it a relationship? Is it a hobby? Whatever it is, he said, lay it aside. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But the second key phrase is this. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Isn't it amazing that when we're down, we're discouraged, it is easy to pass time watching TV. It's easy to pass time surfing the net. It's easy to pass time to see what everything, everyone's doing in their life. But it takes hard effort, hard work to spend time with God that same amount of time. You ever notice that? Am I the only one? It takes work. This is brainless. Oh, cool, yeah. Oh, oh that's the, hey, do you know about this one? That's brainless. But this takes time and energy and effort. But I think it has greater dividends. So he says, lay aside every hindrance and keep your eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he's the source and perfecter of our faith. God's word goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 35. He says this. I am saying this for your own benefit. Not to put a restraint on you but to promote what is proper, and get this last phrase, so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. Isn't that what he wants for us? To be devoted without distraction. I'm just telling you, I struggle with this all my life. We didn't have, we didn't have phrases and labels when I was a kid. If they did, I didn't know about them. I probably have them. But I can remember my dad and maybe some of you use this. Maybe you remember your father's telling you this. Look at my eyes when I speak to you. Look at my eyes. And I can remember a couple times my dad gently just reaching down in front of me and, and, and just touching my chin and bringing my chin up to his face. I will never forget that. Ever. Just simple he says, you look at people in the eye when they speak to you, especially adults. I remember that like it was yesterday. <laughs> Why? Because what he said was important. And he wanted me to make sure that I heard it. And he didn't want me to be distracted by what's going on out the window. Or over in the other room. And he would just simply. And then he would speak. I wonder, does... Jesus expect anything less of us. I think that's why he uses that phrase, so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. And then he goes on to say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek somewhere in the line of all the things that you have to do, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? Is that what it says? What's it say? Seek first. In other words, it has to be the priority of our life. I'm not going to be the person that stands up here and two hands and a foot and says, boy, I got this mastered. I can speak from experience that it's hard some days. I got a to-do list like you have a to-do list. 
And we have these ideas and things we want to get done. And if we're not careful, what Jesus says to do seeking first becomes seeking fifth or sixth or seventh or some days not at all. We need these reminders to reprioritize what is important in our life. He says, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, being like him, all these other things will take care of themselves. I don't have to worry about what's going on in so-and-so's Facebook world. It'll take care of itself. Whether I hit the like button or not, it's still going to be there. Right? It's still going to be there. But do we need to prioritize? Look what he says in Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Luke 9, verse 62, he says this. But Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What does Jesus want from us? To stay focused and to move forward. If we're constantly... I'm not a runner, as you can tell. I was a wrestler. I ran enough to play basketball and enough to play defender in soccer. But I'm not a marathon runner, just in case there's any you know, question of that. Turn sideways, you still see me. I'm not that guy. But we've all been told that if you're going to run a race, what do you never do? You don't look to see who's on your tail. Because the moment that you look back, they'll pass you if they're close. You keep your eye on the goal. Isn't that right, Seth? You run forward. Those of you that run, you don't look about who's, who's on your tail. You keep your focus and you move forward. So what is it that causes you to look back? What is it that distracts you? Maybe I could say it this way. What is it that you worry about that eats your time and your energy and occupies your mind? I can't go back and change the past. But I can deal with today, today. I can set goals for tomorrow. But if I'm living back there, I'm not moving forward. I won't take the time to look at the other passage I have listed here, but Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 through 34. Right away in verse 24 says, No one can serve God and mammon. What's the point there? You can't have two masters. Either Jesus has your heart or something or someone else does. That's it. You can't have two masters. Because you'll always be allegiant to one more than the other. And can I just say this? Talk is cheap. We all know that phrase, right? Talk is cheap. I can say I love God, but if my actions don't prove it, Remember the times when our parents would say, hey, go clean your room? I will. Take out the trash? I will. Go cut the yard? I will. And a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time, they're told. And finally, dad or mom explodes, and they're at level DEFCON 4. And you go out and do it because you're afraid for your life. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. If I say I love Jesus, but spend no time with him. If I say that I am committed to God, but yet Facebook gets most of my time. That's a problem. So practically speaking, look at how you spend your time during a day or a week. See what you spend your time on. If it's too much social media, too much TV, too much hobbies, etc., then cut back and replace these things with things that would honor God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, it's a familiar verse. It says, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Bottom line is, God has called us to be stewards. Everything that we have in this life is not ours, right? It's his. We all understand that, right? As children of God, it's all his. Anything we have, ours because of him. 
It's not yours. You're not yours. Your kids are not yours. Your car is not yours. Your house is not yours. Nothing's yours. Just in case you didn't know that, it's all his. But here's the thing. You're a steward of it. You get to control the operational account of it. You get to take care of it while it's in your possession. You're a steward of it. And that includes our time. Would God be happy? Would it bring him joy with how I spend my time? Or would he be disappointed at how much we waste? Would God be joyful over how we steward the possessions? Or would he be disappointed because we give too much time and attention to the possessions? We need to ask those questions. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 says, Pay careful attention then to how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't be, get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. What's he saying here? Guard your time. Use it wisely. How do we use our time? There are ways that we can overcome distractions. and They all have to do with our making God our number one priority and focusing our life around him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. Am I crucified? Does how I spend my time, how I spend my energy, by what I devote myself to, show that I am crucified with Christ? And when we do that, sometimes we'll have to give up something close to us. But here's the question. Isn't God worth the sacrifice? If we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of our social media time, if we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of our hobby time, if we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of what we dwell on and focus on daily to spend more time in building a relationship with Jesus, don't you think that's a sacrifice that God would be pleased with? A sacrifice that would be beneficial for all of us? Mark chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. Um, Peter. Peter began to tell him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundred times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who will, are first will be last and the last will be first. He says, listen, anybody who's willing to sacrifice for my sake, it'll be worth it. And it may not be in this world. In fact, I can tell you it won't be in this world. It's worth the sacrifice. I just find it amazing in my own life how much, and we've been talking about digital media as a general rule, but how much those types of things captivate us, enslave us. And then there are those who just have to tell the whole world what's going on in their every little moment. And I think, do we have that kind of open, free communication with the Lord? I mean, sometimes I read what people put on there, and I'm like, are they crazy? They actually just put that on for the whole world to see? I wonder how much we're willing to share with the world that we don't even share with Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus knows everything, right? But are we nurturing that relationship? And opening a free communication with that line of thinking. Let me give you four helpful guidelines. I'll use media as the issue, but you may substitute the distraction 
of your choice. Maybe your distraction is a job, a hobby, TV, you name it. I'll use social media as the distraction, but you've put your distraction in its place. Number one, make it a practice to put your digital devices away for a period of time. If something is controlling your life, set it aside for a while. It's kind of funny to me that every once in a while I'll read a Facebook post and it'll say, Facebook is taking too much time. I'll see you in two months. And two days later, they're back posting on it again. <laughs> Anybody seen those? Put it away for a period. If it's, if it's controlling your life, put it away for a while. Regardless of what the distraction may be. Number two, make it a practice to limit the amount of time you use your digital devices. Make it a practice to limit how much time you give to your hobby. Make it a practice to limit how much time you spend in front of the TV. Make it a practice to limit whatever it is that controls and captivates and enslaves you. Number three, this may irritate some of you, and some of you will say, well, I already do that. Make it a practice to go old school when taking notes or reading. Go old school. I'm a digital device freak. I like new stuff. I like computers. I like handhelds. I mean, I was of the Palm Pilot generation, if you can remember that going back that far. When the Palm Pilots came out, I won one. I love, I love that kind of stuff. I'm a gadget guy, if you haven't noticed that. I like two things, pens and gadgets. I hate cheap pens. But I found something recently that has helped me. I found that when I take notes on my phone or on my iPad, it get bur gets buried under layers of files. Ed Tracy got me started on this. I started writing everything in the journal. Everything that's important. I started taking this thing with me everywhere I go. Mike's picked up on that. I have prayer requests. I have ideas. I have sermon notes. I have Bible study notes. I have things that I, I did that day to remember the upcoming events. I took an old calendar and I clipped it up and glued it on the inside and everything I think of goes in my journal. It's not buried underneath file after file after file. Yeah, I know they have to do to-do lists on digital phones, but I found they got buried. And I'm still old school with the books, even though I have an Amazon Kindle account. I just find that reading and underlining helps me. It's okay to go old school once in a while. We're so used to bringing our phone. Anybody feel naked when they forget their phone? They walk out the door? Let's be honest. Anybody? Yeah, there we go. All the gen younger generation. I'd rather... Some people would rather forget their wallet at home than their phone. <laughs> go old school. Join the 70-year-olds that don't have computers once in a while. It'll help you. And then number four. Make it a practice to use your digital devices, your social media wisely. Wisely is the key there. Is it wrong to have Facebook? No. I just used Facebook. I was telling Lisa Morgan on Friday. I hadn't talked to one of my college friends for 20 years. And we talked through Facebook and he gave me a call out of the blue. It was really cool. Facebook has allowed us to reconnect and have relationships with people that we haven't talked to in years. That's not a bad thing. But Facebook can be an addictive thing that controls you if you're not careful, if you don't use it wisely. Be careful what you post. Be careful how much it controls you. And that goes for all of our distractions. I'm going to close with this. You know, in the Word of God, there's a simple story that we've heard hundreds of times. 
It was when Peter was out walking on the water and he sees Jesus. He said, if it's you, let me come out to you. And what did Jesus say? Come. You know, and Peter was the wild card. I mean, he was just the guy that, you know, open mouth, insert foot. And, but I have to applaud his faith. How many of us seeing an object out in the water during a storm would get out of the boat? Not too many of us. Peter did. And it was going pretty good for a while. Gets out of the boat, starts walking towards, whoa, check this out, I'm on water and I'm not going down. I mean, put yourself there just for a moment. That's got to be cool. I've never done it before. I don't think any of you have either. It'd be cool to try, right? You're getting out of the boat, you're walking, and he sees this Jesus. And God's Word tells us in a moment that a gust of wind or a wave became overbearing and Peter began to sink. Do you know why he began to sink? The most simple form of the answer is what? He was distracted. He took his focus off Jesus. But here's the beautiful thing. If I'm going to look around this auditorium this morning and I'm sitting where you are, all of us, if we're honest, would probably have to admit that there's some distractions in our life. Things that happen, things that are taking place, things that we even purposely do or allow that distracts us from what's most important. And I love this about the story of Peter. At the moment that he realizes that he's beginning to sink, where is Jesus? Jesus just reaches down his hand and pulls Peter back up again. What's the point? You may be overwhelmed by distractions, even of your own creation. But now that you realize it, what will you do about it? That's where Jesus is right there saying, I'm still here. Get your focus back on me. I'll help you. We need that. We're talking about getting through the tough stuff. And I say it's a tough stuff. And this is one of the things that people wrote into me and said, hey, could you, could you speak on this subject? You know why it's so tough? Because we're so engrossed in everything. Even things that are mindless. We're, we're, we live in a world that we just want to know what's going on everywhere around us. And it captivates us. And we give in to it. And we share it. And we invite others to do it. It's what we do. And God is saying, wait a minute. I'm more in focus. I'm more important than all this. If we believe that, we need to do something about it. We need to simply say, hey God, I need to reprioritize. I need to, re I need to hit the reset button. And just to be clear this morning, I'm not saying Facebook is evil. I'm not saying Snapchat or Instagram or laptops or iPads or phones are evil. But I am saying if they distract us from what is most important, we need to hit a reset button. Start over. And maybe set some of those things aside for a period of time until we get it back under control. And submit ourselves to focusing on God. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much.